This kid here is Ben. He doesn't know it yet, but he will start an internet company called MailChimp that will make him and his co-founder multi-billionaires. And although Ben is not sitting next to Elon Musk on the Forbes billionaire list, I promise you, this is a story worth listening to. So Ben didn't grow up as a billionaire. He grew up in the 1970s in a small town somewhere in Georgia. Ben's father worked in the army and his mother set up a hair salon in the family kitchen. As a kid, Ben helped by sweeping up the hair and emptying the ashtrays at the end of the day. By the end of high school, Ben wanted to be an automotive designer because of his love for cars. During his first year of college, he quickly realized that engineering wasn't for him. In 1994, at 25 years of age, Ben switched college and transferred to Georgia Institute of Technology, an industrial design school. In college, Ben became friends with Mark Armstrong, who became the co-founder and the heart behind all the tools and projects they built later in their business. But sadly, Ben's and Mark's friendship didn't last forever. But more on that later. At this point in their life, they're still best friends that are about to start a billion dollar company. So during Ben's final year of college in 1998, he started to study web design. So to paint the scene, this was also the year when Google started, when Microsoft became the biggest publicly traded company in the world and when Wi-Fi was still not invented. In other words, a long time ago. In 1998, in the last few weeks of Ben's college time, he applied for a web design job. Ben eventually started as a banner ad designer over at Cox Interactive Media. He wasn't a big fan of the job at first, but in his words, he needed the money. His college friend Mark also started working over at Cox Interactive Media. During work, Ben came across this newspaper article that wrote webportalboysbluemountain.com, the web's biggest greeting card website for $780 million. They were like, dude, let's do that too. In their spare time, they made a greeting card website. They mainly wanted to see if they could ever build enough traffic to make some side money off of it. Ben explains, Mark programmed and I designed cutesy little cards. Then in about a year with virtually no paid marketing, we had 30,000 unique people visiting the website every single month. By then, we had already lost interest. We had day jobs. In 1999, Ben and Mark were working on a project for their bosses. mp3radio.com Ben needed to hire a programmer and after asking for recommendations, he contacted Dan Curzius. This guy, Dan, became one of MailChimp's co-founders years later. When they sold MailChimp for $12 billion in 2021, Dan owned 50% of the company, making him an instant multi-billionaire. In reality, when Ben interviewed Dan for the job in 1999, Dan was under the impression that it was a music-related job. He knew nothing about programming but got hired by bluffing his way in. And Dan confirms that with a laugh. I didn't even know what HTML was, he says. I was a DJ at the time, so I thought this music website was going to have me write about music. Imagine how Dan's world would have been entirely different if he didn't bluff his way into that job for mp3radio.com back in 1999. Choosing another road can alter your entire future. But in the end, it didn't matter whether Dan could code because only a few months later, on April 1st, 2000, they got all laid off. Mark, Ben and Dan. Ben got offered another job at the mother company over at Cox Interactive Media, but decided not to take it. Instead, he wanted to pursue entrepreneurship. On June 20, 2000, Ben and Mark officially founded their company, the Rocket Science Group, a web design and development agency. In Ben's words, he already had two invoices ready to go when he got laid off. I walked down the hall, knocked on doors, and I pitched, and I got two paying gigs before I was laid off. It's hard to to quit. You know, a lot of people look at me and they think, "Oh, you're courageous. You went out and did your own thing." I got laid off. <laughs> uh, and I just thought that was the kick in the pants. I knew that if I didn't try it, then I would probably be maybe a vice president someday. And that's perfectly fine. But for me, 
Always I wanted to run my own thing. That was what I felt like I was kind of raised to do. Not long after they started the Rocket Science Group in June 2000, some of their smaller clients asked them if they could send email newsletters for them. Back then, all the bigger enterprise companies used expensive marketing tools and there weren't many options for smaller businesses. Do you remember Ben and Mark's greeting website, lollipopcards.com, which they made in 1999? Back then, they didn't make any money with it. But it turned out it wasn't totally useless. Mark took a bunch of the code he developed for lollipopcards.com, tweaked it, and it became the foundation for MailChimp.com which sold for $12 billion in 2021. Back then, it was all manual what they did for these clients. Ben and Mark had the tool, but they had to do the work and send those newsletters for their clients. The MailChimp.com website or name didn't exist yet. Later, they built it into a web application so their clients could do it themselves. Just log in and do it yourself, they said to their clients. And this was when the website MailChimp.com was born, in July 2001, the billion dollar tool MailChimp. When MailChimp first started in 2001, it offered a straightforward solution. Here you can see one of the first editions of MailChimp. Back then, when it launched, it provided pay-as-you-go plans, $50 for 2,500 emails, $100 for 5,000 emails, and $250 for 20. 5,000 emails. They treated MailChimp as a small side project because their focus was entirely on the consulting agency, the Rocket Science Group. They would never have thought MailChimp might gain that much steam to be a billion dollar company. And just to give you a little perspective here, this is still the early days of the internet. Google launched four years prior and it was in the midst of the dot-com bubble or the internet bubble. The S&P 500, considered by many investors to be the best overall measurement of the American stock market performance was dropping lower and lower. In August 2002, roughly one and a half years or two years after they created this email tool that later became MailChimp, they sent this email newsletter. They introduced Dan as their new and third partner. In hindsight, becoming a partner was probably one of Dan's best decisions since he became a multi-billionaire in 2021. When they sold MailChimp. Over the next three years, they continued their consultancy work at the Rocket Science Group and continued building MailChimp and other products such as PunchyTime.com and Boxy. As you can see, Ben and his partners were running multiple businesses simultaneously. And although having multiple income streams is nice, they also needed to divide their attention. The big question is, what's the best business idea? Is it MailChimp? Is it the Rocket Science? group or is it one of those other products they built? Because if you truly want to succeed, you must focus on one thing. I hate plan B. And this brings us to the next chapter. In 2005, Ben faced multiple challenges. First, they saw that MailChimp's revenue was climbing from 2,000 MailChimp users in 2003 to 9,000 users in 2005. But their primary business, the Rocket Science Group, the consultancy company, was declining. It was a service business, uh, and you know how that goes. Uh, when we were pitching clients and doing the work, you couldn't do both at the same time because we were so small. If I was working, I wasn't selling. If I was selling, I wasn't working. Yeah. And it was just tough. It was a grind. Right. I started to look ahead and dreaming about, you know, how are we going to make a million dollars? How are we going to make a billion dollars? Mm. So it's hard to make a million with a service-based business. And although MailChimp's revenue increased over the years, they lately saw MailChimp's customers leaving for their competitors, which scared Ben. In 2001, when Ben and Mark launched MailChimp, they were ahead of their competitors. But since they treated MailChimp as a small side project, they had let it stagnate. And this stagnation in MailChimp made them think about selling it when they 
they had an offer for MailChimp for $4 million. And although many of us would immediately say yes to a $4 million check, Ben believed MailChimp could be worth a lot more. The problem was that Ben needed to convince his two co-founders because he wasn't in a position to make this decision by himself. Do you remember I mentioned initially in the beginning of this video that Ben's and Mark's friendship didn't last forever? Well, Mark Armstrong, MailChimp's original co-founder, got bought out for unknown reasons and left the team, the Rocket Science Group and MailChimp, somewhere between 2005 to 2008. So I believe that Mark Armstrong disagreed with Ben and I think that Mark wanted to sell MailChimp for that $4 million check. Eventually, Ben convinced Dan Curzius, the other co-founder, to continue with MailChimp and they decided to buy out Mark. May 2008 was the last time Mark Armstrong was listed as a co-founder and partner on their website. Obviously, money isn't everything. And if Mark was miserable doing his job, he made an excellent choice to leave. But suppose it was anything other than that. In that case, he must be furious at himself for leaving, seeing that his baby, MailChimp, turns out that successful. It sold for $12 billion in 2021. I know I would be furious. Here we can see Mark's Facebook profile stating he left the rocket science group. In July 2007, when Ben and Dan went all in on MailChimp and Mark left, they had 10,000 customers. So what did MailChimp do to grow from 10,000 customers in 2007 to 20 million total users in 2018? Well, they turned on full grind mode and went all in. And to give you a glimpse at the changes they made, let's go through a few of them quickly. So the year 2007, they hired a full-time software developer and marketing guy. They decided to add monthly subscriptions, despite first saying monthly prices are for people with serious mental issues. They added a free trial for 30 days. Then in May 2008, Ben changed the free 30-day trial plan to a forever free plan. This was a game changer because they were still amidst the financial crisis. Who didn't want to have free marketing during one of the most significant economic downturns in history? They made a comparison table on their website attacking their competitors, created a mobile version, upgraded the 25-pager free white paper to a 64-page free white paper with tons of tips. They participated in awards, added an affiliate program, translations, etc. And one of the things that made them different than the rest was their way of being funny. In other words, they were 100% focused on MailChimp now and you could see the effects of it. And if you think Ben was already chilling, you're wrong. He's in the trenches answering customer questions in the comments. And the hard work paid off because they grew from 10,000 customers in 2007 to 80,000 total users in 2009. The big change came when they raised the bar. In 2009, they changed their pricing from this to this. Before, they limited the free plan users to 100 newsletter subscribers. But Ben changed it to a maximum of 500, which was crazy then. As you can imagine, this would have been a difficult choice for Ben and his team in the short term. You're telling some customers that they no longer have to pay, resulting in less revenue. You can read the comments when they introduced their forever free plan of up to 500 subscribers. Oh, what's that you say? All other prices reduced too? Sweet. And all the other comments are positive too. MailChimp's users love this update since it saved them money. Imagine all those customers they pulled away from their competitors. Many of them probably switched to MailChimp because it's free. In 2008, MailChimp turned 8 years old. It's hard for me to believe this, but we launched MailChimp on August 20, 2001. We just hope that someday MailChimp will be able to pay for our lunches. Nah, that'll never happen, we thought. And although Ben is picking up steam with his MailChimp project, the best is yet to come. One year after they introduced their new jacked up free plan, they grew from 80,000 users to 500,000 users. They gained around 60,000 new users monthly. That must have been a fantastic feeling for them. Hopefully Mark didn't read that news though. 
You do remember Mark, right? That's the guy that left just before MailChimp blew up. He probably would have been devastated reading that news after leaving just two years prior. I know I would have been. One year later, in September 2010, Ben was still in the trenches publishing blog posts and answering people's comments. Even early in the morning or late at night at 4 a.m. showing his dedication to making MailChimp a success. Then in February 2011, they made news headlines by boosting the free plan again. People could now create a newsletter for free for up to 1000 newsletter subscribers. And such a free plan was crazy then. Imagine the numbers of customers they pulled away from their competitors. Do know that it's 4 years since they went all in on MailChimp without ever increasing their prices. One thing they did introduce for the first time in August 2011 was premium features. In other words, if you want to use all of MailChimp's features, you must subscribe to one of of its paid plans. Nowadays, this is common practice for software companies to reduce the features in their free plans. But it was totally new for MailChimp back then. In September 11, Ben announced on the MailChimp blog that it reached a big milestone, 1 million users. During the following years, MailChimp kept growing exponentially. From 2011 to 2018, it grew from 1 million users to more than 20 million users. At its peak, it grew by 14,000 new users every single day. In May 2019, things changed. Ben announced in a blog post that they introduced a new MailChimp, the all-in-one marketing platform, instead of being the email marketing tool. They introduced new tiers, pricing and many other things that didn't benefit their customers financially. All other changes in the past most often meant their customers were paying less. This May 2019 update wasn't like any of those before. This announcement resulted in many negative reactions from their customers, saying that they will leave MailChimp because it's becoming more and more expensive. So this is the first time in MailChimp's history that they made changes that negatively impacted their customers financially. So for example, in 2001, 25,000 email credits cost $250. In 2018, 25,000 credits still costed $250. So in a nutshell, after 17 years of of adding more and more features, the credits still had the same price. And that's what many people loved about MailChimp. They were one of the cheapest tools, which was one of their key selling points when they started. Cheap, very cheap. But after May 13, 2019, MailChimp changed its mindset about its pricing. The annual report of 2019 showed for the first time in MailChimp's history that the number of users went down. And not by a tiny bit. They now reported having 12 million users. It's still a lot, but it's 8 million less than the 20 million users one year ago. But no, that's not all. A TechCrunch article wrote that MailChimp would generate 100 million more revenue in 2019 compared to 2018. 8 million fewer users, but 100 million dollars more in revenue. Pretty crazy, right? But wait, there is more. September 13, 2021. Intuit, a software company specializing in financial software, bought MailChimp for $12 billion. So Ben owned 50% of MailChimp and so did Dan. There were no outside investors or shareholders, making Ben and Dan instant multi-billionaires. So this news resulted in many negative comments from MailChimp's employees, saying that their founders always told them they would never sell the company or go public. They were angry because Ben and his other co-founder Dan never allowed employees to buy company stock. No, you're not going to get equity, but you will get to be part of a scrappy company that fights for the little guy. And we will never be acquired or go public. The founders told anyone who will listen they would own MailChimp until they died and bragged about turning down multiple offers. If people had a the sense they wanted to sell the company, they would have been out of there. 
a former MailChimp employee said. Why would I be working without equity if I knew they were going to sell the company for a boatload of money? So this is a tweet from one of MailChimp's employees that works there since 2015. Super cool to read a national publication noting how savvy a business move it was for your employer to prevent you from profiting when they sell. I tried contacting Simone to learn more about her story, but sadly she blocked me without any explanation. I also tweeted Ben to hear his side of the story and learn more about what really happened with Mark Armstrong, but there is no reply on both tweets. In the past 12 months, Milchim generated roughly $1 billion in revenue while seeing a decrease in user numbers. Despite the decrease in user numbers, they continue to increase prices. Adding limitations to the free plan for the first time ever, making it far less valuable than its competitors. Milchim changed its original growth strategy to maximize revenue and it is working. The thing is, especially with public companies like the one that just bought MailChimp, the stock price will often go down too if revenues go down. MailChimp's new CEO has two jobs. Instead of listening to the needs of MailChimp's customers, they now have to listen to their other customers too, their shareholders. Yes, Ben and Dan accomplished something extraordinary, bootstrapping a $12 billion company. But I'm not sure this is the best for the Milgram customer. What do you think?